Today is a special meeting of the Board of Fire Commissioners. This is Wednesday, January 19th, 2022, and the time is 9 a.m. Ms. Gomez, would you do a roll call, please? Yes. Woods Gray? Here. Babcock? Hara? Here. Ibarra? Ninberg? Here. Fire Chief Terrazas? Here. Deputy City Attorney Linda Nguyen? Here. You have a quorum, Ms. Mel. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Gomez, would you like to do the rules uh, for our meeting? Sure. At this time so that people will un get prepared. Yes. Persons may listen to this meeting live by dialing any of the telephone numbers listed on the cover of the agenda for this meeting. Should you dial one of these numbers, you will be able to listen to the meeting but will not be able to give public comment during the meeting. Anyone wishing to address the Board of Fire Commissioners on any item on the agenda or to provide general public comment should call 1-669-900-9767. When you are asked for a meeting ID, please enter, and please note this is a new meeting ID for 2022-881-2091-3045, followed by the pound sign. Then press the pound sign again to continue. You will then be joined into the meeting. To alert the board that you want to give public comment, press star 9. You will be called on by board staff who may refer to you using the last three digits of the phone number you are calling from. When unmuted by staff, press star six, and please state your name. As a general reminder, public comment will be limited to one minute per agenda item and up to two minutes allowed for agenda items. At the request of the speaker, the speaker will be afforded an additional one minute for general public comment for a maximum of three minutes total per speaker. Time cannot be ceded to another speaker and an individual may speak only once during the public comment period. Only those who are in the queue when this president begins the public comment section of the agenda will be allowed to speak. Only those who are in the queue when the president begins the public comment section of the agenda will be allowed to speak. These instructions may also be found on the front page of the meeting agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Chief Tarasas. Good morning, Madam President. Uh, good to see you here. Would you lead us in the pledge, a uh, flag salute, and a moment of silence, please? Absolutely. Please stand right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. States of America. To the republic, to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God. One nation under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for and all. Justice. Now, would you please join me in a moment of silence and honor past and present members of the Los Angeles Fire Department who devoted their lives to the protection of our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Tarazas. Um, let's see, bring my picture back here. Okay, very good. Uh, then now we're at the uh, section for commissioner comments. Um, the comments, after yesterday's announcement uh, at the press conference, um, I won't even go into that. We'll get to that later, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, thank all the firefighters who've been taking care of everyone and taking care of themselves, getting vaccinated, uh, testing so that we can all stay safe. Um, are there any commissioner comments from other commissioners? Yes, ma'am, um, Commissioner Hara. Um, I was disappointed that we didn't uh, get to participate in a parade on uh, Martin Luther King Day. Um, oh, yeah. But um, having said that, uh, I did attend the press conference uh, yesterday and uh, where um, Mayor Garcetti and then uh, uh, City Council President uh, uh, Miriam Martinez 
uh, and then, of course, um, Chief Terrazas and, uh, of course, Chief uh, Crowley was, were were there and had uh, great comments, I felt. Um, and um, Chief uh, Crowley did uh, address the issue of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which uh, will be part of a mantra in the uh, uh, years to come. And so congratulations to, um, uh, to Chief Crowley whenever she gets officially um, uh, inducted. <laughs> okay, very good. I'm glad that you were able to be there, Dr. Hart. You're always there to represent the commission, which is uh, much appreciated. Um, it, are, is, is it, I think there's, uh, Commissioner Nimberg, do you have comments to, for this morning? I think you're the only other, it's the first of three of us, so. Okay. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Is my Wi-Fi? Might be. Is it well, difficult? we see you. Okay. No, we hear you. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> first, yeah, I know, some big news happening. Uh, I first... Before we go into Chief Crowley, I do want to congratulate Chief Chris Larson on her award, the Rosa Parks Award, oh, yes. the Humanitarian Award from the yes. Christian Leadership Conference um, for her work in advancing uh, racial and gender equity. So congratulations on that. Um, I And I also want to uh, congratulate Chief Kristen Crowley on her nomination to be the next fire chief to lead the LAFD. Um, and I want to commend the mayor and President Nuri Martinez for making this choice. It's not only uh, extraordinary, it's historic. And it gives me great hope that this department can finally begin to heal from the generations of systemic cultural issues that have plagued the department. Uh, Chief Crowley, as we heard yesterday, is not only a hero on the fire ground, as well as EMS, um, she's also a hero amongst those who have worked under her leadership. When she stepped into the Fire Prevention Bureau as fire marshal, Chief Crowley took the helm of a bureau that was struggling. It was, there were difficult times and morale was at an all time low. She was able to build trust with members. She prioritized their well being. She took their suggestions into consideration. She sought buy in. And today, the Fire Prevention Bureau is a new department thriving with a workforce that feels valued, encouraged, while also being held accountable to a high standard of excellence. Um, so I look forward when Chief Crowley takes the helm of the LAFD that she will once again be able to meet this moment. And I have great faith for, that she will be able to repeat her successes and begin to heal this department, increasing morale while also demanding accountability and excellence. Chief Crowley, I'm excited to work with you for the remainder of my stay on this commission. And I have great faith that you will be able to lead this department to brighter days. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yesterday was a historic day uh, and surprising in a lot of ways. Uh, historic in that the mayor uh, and the chief worked together and they came up with a new chief that had never been appointed in the city of Los Angeles before. So that it was it was historic, and um, I have to congratulate the chief because he's now getting ready to go into his best life, retirement. That's a the best part of <laughs> of your life is going into retirement, and after the, of almost forty years of service, you can't. Uh, I mean, God, think of all of the places and people that you touched as you went along the way. Uh, and I hope that when they do the retirement time, that we'll be out of COVID so that we can all come and talk about all of the innovations and the things that you've done in this department. Um, 
and the things that uh, have happened throughout the years uh, and celebrate with your family. And that, um, as I said, retirement is the best life. So everybody should look forward to that and have a big smile. Yes, because it is <laughs> a time when you can do whatever you want to do, want to do. I love it. Um, and and I totally forgot. I actually attended the SCLC uh, dinner. It was on Zoom, but they delivered our dinner. So it was really great. We could eat while we celebrated. And that, uh, that um, Chief Larson was the honoree. She received the Rosa Parks Award for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is an organization that was started by Dr. Martin Luther King. And every, Mar- every um, Martin Luther King weekend, we have a dinner for, I don't know how many years. It's been forever, I can remember. But um, it was wonderful to see someone uh, getting that award who has worked hard and has come been a leader in the forces and kind of like a Rosa Parks stood up when others may not have stood up. So we thank you, Chief Larson, for all the work you do and wish you continued success uh, and thank SCLC for recognizing a firefighter, uh, which is an important thing because we don't often see that many firefighters recognized in the community. We know they do good things, but they don't get recognized for it. So that was uh that was very special and i was happy to be able to be there to witness that that event um hi uh commissioner this is uh commissioner ibarra i'm sorry um that i'm not oh hi commissioner ibarra hi good morning good morning i'm sorry that i'm i'm sorry that i'm not going to be able to stay i have a i have a conflict so i just briefly wanted to make some comments for the record um, I, as you know, my, my, my conflict, uh, pre-existed the announcement from yesterday, but I, it would, I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, make a note of the historic event. So let me just briefly read my comments into the record. Uh, first, I want to congratulate Chief, uh, Kristen Crawley on what will be a historic tenure as new fire chief. As the first warm, woman, she will blaze a trail for many who will surely follow. I'm eager to support her in every way. Mm-hmm. Second, I also want to express my deep gratitude to Chief Terrazas with her, for his nearly eight years at the helm of this department. He has been a calm, steady force with tremendous credibility in the field. At every large emergency during his tenure, Angelinos were reassured by his presence in knowing that everything was going to be okay. Administratively, he rebuilt this department after it was defunded by the last mayor. And while doing so, he increased diversity throughout the department and lowered our liability for EEO related claims, especially as to women and people of color to an unheard of number of under $10,000 during his eight year tenure. He embraced technological innovation and maintained its operational preeminence. This is still the best department in the world, bar none, and it is so because Chief Terrazas ensured that it would remain so. I will have more to say in the two months that remain before the transition is complete, but I cannot let this opportunity go by without adding my voice to the chorus of grateful Angelinos who celebrate the historic moment for Chief Crawley and for Chief Terrazas. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, audience. Thank you, members of the department for, uh, you know, for all your work during the pandemic and during these uh, divisive times, uh, striving to stay united. Uh, I need to go to my next, um, to my next Zoom meeting, but uh, have a good meeting, everybody. Bye. Thank thank you for dropping in. Thank you for your comments. Um, Very good. Um, Next. We will move on. If no com- other commissioners have comments, we have we have no other commissioners there. Um, now we're at number two, which is the report of the fire chief. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I do want to comment about Chief Crowley's announcement, but before I do so, I have to mention a sad uh, occasion. On December 29th, I attended the funeral of Captain Bill James in San Pedro. Oh. Captain James was in his early 50s, assigned to Fire Station 85 in Harbor City. 
and he lived in the San Pedro community, not too far from me. He passed away way too young from duty related mm -hmm. causes, I believe. And uh, he had a huge impact on the youth that came to fire station 85 to learn how to become a future firefighter. And I got to meet many of the young uh, men and women who participated at the uh, fire station 85 uh, post. Now I'd like to, to talk about what occurred yesterday. Um, Chief Crowley has been uh, amazing. Under my tenure, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to promote her three times. And that's not a coincidence. That's due to her hard work, her uh, conscientiousness, her uh, diligence. Uh, I first promoted her to the assistant chief in charge of professional standards division. So she has a very good understanding of all things related to discipline. And then I promoted her to deputy chief as our fire marshal in the fire prevention bureau. And she did a wonderful job there. She created a team and that team is a highly productive team. And I'm very proud of what she has done there. And most recently, I promoted her to the administrative operations chief deputy position uh, seat, where she's in charge of all non-emergency functions of the department. At every assignment, she has performed at the highest level, and I expect her con to continue to do so. I do believe the department is in very good hands and will be for many years to come. And with your permission, Madam President, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Crowley to hear from uh, her comments. Oh, wonderful. Good morning, Chief Crowley. Hi, good morning. Welcome. Thank you. And Thank congratulations you. again. I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you, Chief Terrazas, for your kind words. Uh, you know, what an amazing opportunity. I want to congratulate you, uh, first and foremost, on your uh, upcoming retirement, 38 years of service to the city. Um, thank you for doing what you did for the city, uh, as well as our department. Um, just really inspired and, and excited about stepping into this new uh, leadership role. Um, you'll be talking and collaborating with uh, the members of the department as well as the community and city leaders. And uh, I'm just looking forward to it. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm ready to get to work. Thank you very much, Chief Crowley, for accepting the, uh, the role because that's a big, it's a, a big responsibility. And, and I know that you will, I look forward to working with you. You've been through all the seats, so you know how everything works in the department, uh, as the chief has just said. So we welcome this opportunity. And I don't remember, but I think it's like, is this our third or fourth chief since we had, since we started eight years ago? But uh, so we've had Chief Terrazas for a long period of time, which was good because for once at the beginning of this, Commission, we were like on a treadmill. We were turning them over a couple of times there, I think. Right. <laughs> so we brought some stability to this department. Very good. Thank you so much. I look forward to working uh, with the both of you as you make the transition um, from one to the other. Okay. Now the uh, we're at uh, public comment. Miss Gomez. Yes, ma'am. I see three hands, I don't know, are there more? Yes, I've requested um, twice already to unmute for the first one. I have noted, and there you are, number ending in 108. Uh, what agenda item or items will you be speaking on? And do you have general public comment, please? Yes, general public comment and agenda item 6A. Wonderful, thank you so much, you have two minutes. Good morning, uh, Madam President, Commissioners, uh, Fire Chief Tarazas, Command Staff, City Attorney Nguyen. My name is Chris Larson. I'm President of Los Angeles Women in the Fire Service. Um, I'm looking at this gender equity report, and I, I see towards the end some kind of concerning numbers. It, it says the total number of women hired since 2014 is 119, with an average retention rate of 53%. 63 of the 118 women are currently deployed, employed by the department. Um, I think we need to do better than that. 
I would be interested to see if this number would be equivalent um, for minorities, Asians, African Americans, and Hispanics. Um, we've got to do better. We do have a lot of women retiring in the next few years, and that total percentage of women is going to go below 3.5% if we don't try to do everything we can to increase those numbers. And as president of LAWFS, I'm willing to do whatever I can to assist in that matter. Thank you very much. Oh, and Chief, Chief Larson, since we have you on the phone, congratulations in person. Thank you very much, Commissioner. That was, that was a real honor to have you get the Rosa Parks Award from the SCLC. It, yes, Thank it you. was a tremendous honor. Thank you for all your work. You're welcome. Number ending in 253, I've requested that you unmute. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, please confirm the item or items you'll be speaking to, and do you have general public comment? Uh, yes, I have general public comment. I would also like to speak on commissioner comment and agenda item uh, 6A. Very well, you have three minutes. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Hawkins. I'm the Executive Vice President of uh, the Stentorians. I want to uh, say good morning to uh, Madam President, all fire commissioners, uh, both fire chiefs, uh, Ralph Terrazas and uh, Chief uh, Christian Crawley, and uh, everybody in attendance. Um, I want to start my uh, my statement with a quote. Uh, first thing, um, change is good. Change is important. Change can be uncomfortable in the beginning but nothing is as painful as being as staying stuck somewhere we don't belong. The Stentorian organization would like to congratulate Chief Ralph Terrazas on his recent retirement. We would also like to congratulate Chief Christian Crawley on her nomination to fire chief. We look forward to working with Chief Crawley on, on issues of mutual concern. The Stentorians stand ready and willing to assist any and all agents of change. We want to thank the commission for the opportunity to message the importance of partnerships and collaborations. Lastly, we wish you all and your families a very safe and happy new year. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Number ending in 105, I've requested that you unmute. Which item? or items will you be speaking to? And do you have the general public comment, please? General public comment, uh, comments regarding commissioner comments and all agenda items. Freddie Escobar, president of UFLAC. Three minutes. All right, good morning. And um, I wanna start with clearing the record. Chief Crowley, congratulations. Chief Terrazas, as we move forward, I would like both of you to stop and, and acknowledge the men and women that are working and state to the public that we are closing companies and some stations are black, just like fire station eight was last week. We have a staffing crisis and we cannot afford to lose any members regardless, especially during this COVID pandemic that still exists. We need to return all members. I'd like to put something in the records regarding comments I want to start by congratulating Kristen Crowley on her appointment to serve as the next fire chief of the Los Angeles City Fire Department. Chief Crowley and I have worked together, had her numerous assignments in the past, and I look forward to working with her in the future for long term as the fire chief of the Los Angeles City Fire Department. And I, as a dedicated firefighter, Chief Crowley has worked throughout her 22 career in the LAFD and is committed to the men and women of our department. UFLAC supports her appointment and will advocate for her confirmation in the city council. <clears throat> now more than ever, the LAC is facing enormous staffing challenges that need to be addressed immediately. Due to these shortages, our members are being forced to work long hours and it's taken a toll on both their physical and mental health. Each day, the LAFD is closing multiple resources throughout the city, putting everyone's safety in jeopardy our current way of operating is not sustainable. We are at a breaking point. 
Chief Crowley is the right person to address these issues as our next fire chief. She has the experience and leadership necessary to support our firefighters during these challenging and unprecedented times. This is a historic appointment, and UFLAT looks forward to working with her during, the comp during her confirmation process and when she officially becomes the next fire chief. Lastly, even though I know that he isn't leaving yet, I want to publicly thank Chief Terrazas for your tremendous service to the city of Los Angeles that spans nearly four decades. We don't agree on everything, but I know that you receive far too much unfair criticism and not enough credit for your leadership you have provided for more than eight years as our fire chief. UFLAC is proud to work with you and now Chief Crowley as we address the biggest issue facing our department. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, can you hear me okay? Good morning. This is number ending in 575. Yep, good morning. And can good you, morning. you hear me? Yes, the question Hi. is um, which item or items are you speaking to and do you have general um, public comment? Yeah, um, general public comment and item 6A and 6B. Okay, you have three minutes and please state your name. Okay, great. My name is Michelle. I'm calling from Northridge. Um, I want to congratulate uh, Chief Kristen Crawley. That is amazing. So it's definitely a step in the right direction. So I'm really happy to see that. Um, also, the retention rate, there's only been 53% retention rate of females recruited and hired, um, which is really unacceptable. No, I mean, there's no female uh, apparatus operators, no females in specialty positions, along with over... 50% of uh, women experience harassment and discrimination, which is a clear sign that LAFD has a severe sexism problem. Um, making sure that the LF, uh, LAFD is properly trained in domestic violence and human trafficking are really critical to addressing successfully um, these issues. So there's been a huge spike in domestic violence during the pandemic and uh, now is not the time we should be stopping this kind of training. And uh, lastly, Freddie Escobar, um, who just spoke, he keeps stating that there's no issue with sexism or racism in the department, um, despite all of the studies that have come out. Um, and most recently, the one that was just published uh, in December, clearly illustrating chronic systemic racism and sexism um, and a toxic work environment. So, I mean, my understanding that the union representative is supposed to represent uh, all firefighters, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, we have to take um, this seriously and um, we have to get rid of uh, male toxicity, to be quite frank. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, that was the last speaker. Okay, thank you very much, Gomez, uh, for that. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, thank you to all the people who come and speak uh, from the public, because the public input is important. Um, let's see, uh, the next item is number four, uh, and that's our determination under the government code 54953E1. Uh, we've done this a couple of, uh, several times, several meetings. Um, I think that the conditions we're living under are still, uh, will impact the ability of our members to meet safely in person. So I would like to obtain a motion to continue with our virtual, to approve uh, item 4A so that we can continue to meet in virtual settings. Is there a motion or discussion? I make a motion to continue the uh, item 4A for another 30 days. 
Is there a second? Dr. Hara has his hand up. I second. Oh. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so it's been moved to second and that second that we uh, approve and continue item 4A. Um, Ms. Gomez, we do a roll call, please. Yes, what's great? Aye. Hara? Aye. Ninberg? Yes. And just um, to note for the record, Ms. Ma'am, I did note that Commissioner Barr was present for the meeting from approximately 9.12 a.m. to 9.14 a.m. Oh, thank you. Very good. Now, moving on to um, the uh, consent agenda items, item number five, I want to thank the LAFD uh, Fire Foundation because they're always so helpful in getting us the equipment and materials that we normally might not have under the city budget. Uh, and I know there's such an item in on the consent calendar. So uh, we thank them for all the work that they do and continue to do. Uh, is there, uh, are there any comments or pulls or any concerns about the consent agenda item? If not, a motion is in order to approve the item. Make a motion to approve, to approve the consent agenda items 5A through 5C. Is there a second? second. Okay, so it's been moved second. and second that, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Dr. We've been moved and second that we approve uh, items A, B, and C on the consent agenda items. Um, Ms. Uh, Gomez, would you roll call, please? Yes. What's Gray? Aye. Hara? Aye. Ann Nindberg? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, very good. Moving on to item six, which is the regular agenda items. <clears throat> the first one is item A. Um, it's BFC 22-004. It's the uh, fourth quarter agenda update. And I believe that uh, is Chief uh, Gurley. Yes, ma'am. Oh, good morning. Good there morning. Good morning, Madam President. Come now, is, is the rumor I heard true that yes, you're retiring? Yes, oh my God! You know we're just losing too much experience in this department. Well, but you know what? We're we're uh, headed to uh, brighter days. Um, I feel very confident. I'm extremely happy. Um, it's been a, an amazing career. I'd do it again. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity before I get into the report uh, to to uh, thank Chief Terrazas. Um, for his leadership and um, his belief in me and and um, my colleagues that are that are uh, on the call today, um, I think we all would would agree that um, this is just amazing. I, I I can't say enough what it has provided for my family, myself, the friendships, the the learning opportunities, and um, I, you know I hate to leave, but. There are there are other things, and I think it's time that we allow our younger members and those that have not had the opportunity to promote yet to step up and, and show us what they got. Um, I, I think it's a good time right now. We're coming out of COVID. Hopefully, we'll be coming out of it sooner than later. Um, obviously, the LAFD has been an amazing organization throughout this entire pandemic. Uh, we've mm -hmm. stepped up to the sure. plate. And we've uh, saved lives and we continue to save lives despite, you know, the, the obstacles that we know we have, right? We, we know this. This is not new to us. Um, but uh, I feel extremely proud that I was here for the, um, for the announcement of the nomination of Chief Crowley as our next fire chief. Uh, and also, just for whatever it's worth, I, I'm very anxious to see what the metrics bring us with uh, more women um, you know, putting in applications for the fire department. It's huh? just a speculation, but I think it's, <laughs> I think it's a step. I think it's a, a very important step. And that's, that's no, no uh, disrespect to Chief Terrazas at all. It's just, it is what it is and we know it. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I really, I really am. And, and uh, I will miss all of you, but um, you know, you can contact me uh, 
and um, you know we can have lunch or meet virtual, whichever you whichever you prefer. But it's been an amazing ride, and and I want to thank everybody and everybody on this call, all the chiefs, and especially I would um, not to minimize anybody, but Chief Poyer and Chief Richmond, Chief Pateras. Uh, I, I can't go through all of it. Chief Hogan, he and I have a special relationship as well, kind of on a fun side, but um, it's just been amazing. Amazing. Well, you've been amazing. And I hope that you've left some notes for somebody who can, when we're out of COVID, they can go and do those fabulous workshops that you do that help to protect people and give people pointers on how to protect themselves because you had so much good information to share. And uh, the teachers union uh, people, over 300 people would always talk about you and how wonderful you were and the information, how valuable it was. So um, I, I, we can't say enough about the work that you've done and because uh, and I have a personal experience and I know exactly wh how it was. I remember the time you came and uh, the PowerPoint went out <clears throat> and it didn't work. And you just went right on. No one ever knew that you didn't that you needed that PowerPoint because you threw in a few jokes. And I mean, the little th everybody loved it. They just really, really enjoyed it. So uh, I really thank you for your professionalism and your expertise. And this with this department. And I'm sure you'll be a phone call away for Chief Crowley. <laughs> yes, ma'am. She knows how to hold me. But I want to thank you for those comments. And really, I want to, and I'm going to go back to say that it's about the training. It's about the structure that we have as, as employees of this organization, um, as public servants, right? It's, it's really about taking care of people. And I, I've said this before, and for those who haven't heard it, um, uh, I, I will say that as a, as a paramedic in the field, I may legitimately save one or two lives in a 24 hour period but having the opportunity to teach and do disaster preparedness talks and those presentations potentially saves thousands of lives and Very to true. me you know that's just um that's so important and i've i've always been extremely grateful for the opportunities and i will continue uh as i go forth into the next chapter um of my life so it will be it will be fun we we'll have more time to do those beautiful carvings <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah thank you so much thank you very much i appreciate it so uh on the fourth quarter gender report i i, I think the most important thing are the highlights uh chief larson congratulations uh, to you as well. And uh, there were a few comments that highlighted some of the things in the report, obviously, that are that are glaring, to say the least. We know where we stand with regard to the percentage of women on the department. Um, we know historically uh, how many we've hired. Um, and we've also heard public comment on uh, that we don't have women in certain ranks. We know that as well. Um, but again, I feel confident that we're going to get there, but we, we just have to be strategic about um, mentoring and, and getting those people and encouraging them um, to move forward and upward in their career. Um, the other important thing uh, with regard to this report is that the fiscal year 21-22, we're going to lose two females, me at the end of February, and then we'll lose another uh, female officer in May of May of this year as well. Uh, and I just want to highlight, um, even though it's looking forward, looking ahead, I think it's important that in fiscal year 22-23, we will lose four females. And in fiscal year 23-24, we're scheduled according to the drop. Now, remember, you know, this could, this could change, right? But if, if it pans out, 23-24, we would lose eight females. Um, oh, nice. Right. So, but we'll be hiring as well. And, and I feel confident. I do. I think that with our recruitment and with our, with our command staff, with what we have in place, um, I, I don't know. I just feel good about the fact that I think we're going to get more women. I think times are changing and, and the fabric is changing. Um, and we have this opportunity and, and I know that all of the sections and bureaus that are responsible for that will definitely um, to use that to the advantage, and, and we will be uh, hopefully seeing those numbers rise. 
Thank you very much. I'm I'm very glad to hear uh, your your hopefulness, <clears throat> and we definitely need to do a lot of work there because we're losing. When you lose eight people in a department that has so few women, you're losing almost a half of the department. It looks like you're going to lose a third of it for sure. Um, so there is a lot of work to do, and hopefully that uh, pandemic uh, will let us get out and be able to do more recruiting or find a way to work within the pandemic that we can uh, recruit <clears throat> and uh, work on issues that will attract and maintain uh, the women that we do recruit um, in the department. So thank you again for that. Thank you for the report. Are there comments from the commissioners or questions for Chief Gurley? Yes. Hello. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Chief Gerlich. End of February? Yes, ma'am. No. <laughs> oh. Well, I do have to say, and I, um, I cannot believe how fortunate all Angelinos are to have had you on this department, thank to you. have you in leadership. And I do want to commend Chief Terrazas for promoting you to battalion chief. This is, um, especially as, uh, you know, you didn't come in as firefighter. So it's extraordinary what you've been able to do, the lives you've touched, um, including all of ours. It is, it's an honor to know you. It's an honor to work with you. And um, while I do have to say, I am heartbroken that you're leaving. Um, I do have, you know, I hope you just enjoy so much time that you've earned off. And, um, and I look forward to, you know, asking you questions <laughs> out in retirement when we, when needed. It is, uh, I know that, I know that you are passionate about this department. It shows. And um, once again, just so grateful for your service. And it is a huge loss for us. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. But um, and stop that because we're going to cry, and that's not going to be an acceptable. No, I, I will tell you when right. when Commissioner Woods Gray was talking, and when you were talking, I was like, yeah, okay, yeah. I don't need to get into you it. Know, but, yes. but, but the good thing is, is that we we've, we've paved the road, and um, and and we allow we allow for for new and and um, younger as capable, more capable people to move up the ranks and hopefully, you know, to, to encourage it, you know, it doesn't matter male and female. I mean, we really, it's an amazing opportunity, this organization, um, it's, it is. And what we do, what we do every day, the lives we save, the lives we touch, um, just what we juggle, I think is, is really commendable. Um, and we're a team, all of us. So I think that's what's important. And, you know, I carry that into everyday life, which um, it makes me a better person. It has made me a better person. And, and again, I, I, I've gone through six fire chiefs just in my, in my tenure. And, um, you know, it's, it's been amazing. You know, it's, it's changed, but it's good change. And here we go again. And, and I think uh, Commissioner um, Madam President, you know, to your point, I think this is a great opportunity, although COVID hit us and it hit us hard, it's hit everybody hard. Um, we've had to reset and learn how to navigate through things. Um, uh, we're, we're doing a great job. And as an unintended consequence, it's allowed all of us in those different areas that involve recruitment and, and all of that, it, it's given us some time. It's given us time to do more research and to have a game plan and, and a strategy in place. And so uh, I do feel confident and I do believe in this organization and I know it will continue and it, and it will be amazing as it has always been. So I look forward to that. Um, Commissioner Nimberg, you have my number, so feel free to call me. Um, and I'm here. I'm here for all of you at any point in time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank um, you very much. And for your and for your work with the uh, pandemic, thank you for the work you did there, too, because under Chief Terrazas, this department did step up and do extraordinary things uh, as far as uh, helping with the pandemic. Uh, commendable things. Yes. I'm sorry, Commissioner. 
Oh, no, no, it's it's totally (laughs) fine, Madam President. Um, I I agree. This department and under the leadership of Ralph Chief Terrazas that uh, our response to the pandemic was extraordinary. So thank you for that. I know it it has nothing to do with uh, this report, but it is, yes, we, and there is, yeah, we can get into that, but you're not retiring yet. So, you know, (laughs) that's. We may not That's, see her between now and February. February mm-hmm. is just a same with Chief Terrazas. Yeah. We're going to see him through March. I know, well, but yeah. I'm saying we yeah, won't see Stacy, uh, the, the chief. We won't see her probably again. Oh, so we're just taking Berlin? advantage of it. <laughs> February. This is January. We have twenty-one days. One meeting. I'm not counting. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> But usually they don't always come to every meeting. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. President, uh, may I add my uh, oh, uh, Chief Terrasa? My my congratulations to Chief Gerlich as well. Uh, she brought in a, a huge measure of energy and enthusiasm uh, when we promoted her to Battalion Chief. Uh, she has a lot of fans out there. I heard from a lot of people, and I was planning on promoting her, promoting her anyway because of the great work she's done. But it, it added confidence to the decision when I heard from so many supporters. I only regret we didn't have her longer in the chief rank. But I want to say thank you, Stacy, for all that you've done. I want to wish you a long and happy and healthy retirement. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that. And if you need a caddy, I'm here. <laughs> I will need one. Yes, my back is killing me. I got you covered. Yeah. And he's going to have a lot of time. <laughs> to enjoy the golf course. So okay, I have, very oh, good. But I want to talk about um, just a couple things on the, the report. report. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I I know all the uh, oh, platitudes. They're great. Um, but I do want to um, say that to your point, Chief Gerlich, um, and I believe some of the callers as well, uh, Chief Larson. Uh, 53% retention rate of the women from 2014 that we've hired, we've, we've lost. I mean, we're talking, so when you're looking at this, we are talking about 55 women and we're, we're, you know, we're looking at like an impact of two people retiring, which is huge. And then an, an additional eight, but the 55 that we've, that we had hired and then lost um, is alarming. It's alarming because that also, you know, our recruitment efforts have been so robust. We've worked, I mean, and so successful and um, it's disheartening (laughs) to say the least to see that we're losing one out of every two Mm -hmm. that we're hiring that have gone through this rigorous process. Um, I, so I, I also um, am interested in seeing these numbers. So I love, not love, but it's horrific, but I, I appreciate this format. And I, I'd also like to see this done for all races um, as well as, um, and broken out um, by LGBTQ as well. Um, I think those, those who are um, Mm -hmm. certainly out, I I think it's important to start addressing those issues as well. Um, And those who identify, those who don't, I mean, I'm sure we have a lot of non-binary, but you know, we're, it's time we start addressing this. It is, it's been a long time and it's 2022 and I think it's time. And um, good point. So um, I, would love to see this brought back. Um, I don't know how much time you have. I want to see you again. So I don't know if we can do it in the next 30 days. (laughs) Completely selfishly. If you Um, ask for it, I will do it. (laughs) Okay. In the next 30 days, I would love to see that. Um, That would be very fantastic and really selfishly to see you as well and to bid you a proper adieu. Um, I, but not yet. Um, I also am very... You know, I thought 
what was fantastic was when um, Deputy Mayor Brenda Shockley came and spoke, and she talked about equity. Mm-hmm. And not just numbers, but equity at every level. And so when we see issues of like glaring issues, like zero female apparatus operators, zero, Um, zero specialty positions. I also am deeply concerned that your captain ones and captain twos, those are our pipeline for leaders. And the fact that we have in, you know, we have good numbers, great numbers in representation at the chief level uh, for women and uh, and soon to be the fire chief who will also uh, just, I believe as Chief Crowley had mentioned and you as well, Chief Gerlich, just being in that position will hopefully attract more diversity, more women to want to join the LAFD under under a female. Just seeing it, if you see it, you can be it. And I think in this world, um, we still, you know, look at this profession as, you know, males, you know, are, it's very gendered. And so, um, I mean, you broke the barriers, what, 37 years ago, 35 years ago? How many? Four, 34? It'll be 35 and a half, but, you 35 know, and okay, a half. I, I'll go either way. Yeah, <laughs> 35 and a half. And, um, and our numbers are still stubbornly low and low at every level. Um, and not, unfortunately, you know, we have them, um, we have, you know, representation at inspector one, inspector two levels, um, firefighter one, firefighter two, but then it dramatically drops down in firefighter three. Um, firefighter one, paramedics, I, it's, there, this is a great roadmap. And these are great numbers that we can use as a baseline to really intend, you have to be intentional about, about equity at every level. So um, I, I don't, you know, this is going to take a long time. Uh, I think this work will be, um, we certainly need to deal with it now. Um, but, uh, I think in, there's a lot of, you know, like ideas of what we can go forward. I think we're in this transition period. So, um, personally, I'm not going to press too hard right now for solutions, but I think just getting another report in 30 days would be really great. And then we can go into solutions, um, uh, afterwards. But this is this is a start, and I believe, and I just appreciate the department um, for being honest. And we cannot, if you cannot diagnose a problem, you cannot address the problem. And so, properly diagnosing issues and seeing them gives us the ability to address them. So, um, thank you so much, and I think that uh, I look forward to the next report so that we can actually compare it. So, thank you. And I think you're doing you're doing the next report too. So. Oh, are you okay? Well, let's first we have to dispose of this one. Uh, are there any other questions, concerns, or comments on this report? If not, then we need a motion to receive and file. I think it's a receive and file. Oh, I make a motion to receive and file item six A. There a second. Dr. Is there a second? Commissioner Hara has his hand. I think his hand is up. Does that mean this? Okay. I got unmuted. <laughs> second. Okay. Oh, thank you, Dr. Hara. <clears throat> it's been moved and second that we uh, receive and file item VFC 22-004. Uh, Ms. Gomez, would you do a roll call, please? Yes. What's gray? Aye. Hara? Aye. And Ninberg? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Now we move on to item B. And Chief Girl, you're doing that one too? 
Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this, very good. This is the quarterly update on the domestic violence and human trafficking. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, again, the I think the highlights of this are the fact that we, we have not had any training um, since 2019. Um, we, oh. and we are we are aware of that. However, with the pandemic, um, things definitely came to a halt in, in many areas, not just this one. Um, this is extremely an important topic for all of us. Um, we have, as we all know, over 1,400 opportunities to potentially uh, recognize that there may be an instance of either domestic violence or human trafficking when we respond to our 911 calls. Um, but in as much as we have not had the training, um, there has been research in the background being done as to what might be the best approach uh, when we get back up into training um, and how should that look or how might that look that would be beneficial to the organization. So uh, I reached out to a nonprofit, Ruby's Place, that does um, domestic violence and human trafficking specifically. Uh, and you can see in the report that it was an estimated cost of approximately 30000 for that type of training. And it would, there were a couple of different platforms. It could be done either in person or it could be done via Zoom. Um, and then, of course, depending upon what our situation is with the COVID pandemic will somewhat dictate what direction we take with that. Um, but more importantly, I reached out to our LAPD partners who um, have a, an actual bureau that deals with domestic violence and human trafficking. And I was able to watch the presentation from uh, one of their uh, sergeants who is a um, subject matter expert in specifically uh, domestic violence and the human trafficking. Uh, my personal opinion was I thought it was extremely beneficial because it, it dealt a lot with the visual aspects of being able to recognize um, people that are involved in the human trafficking and or um, victims of domestic violence. Uh, his specific training would be about an hour and a half, but then it would allow time for questions. Um, that could be done either in person or, again, via uh, a Zoom presentation. Uh, as you remember, I, I believe when we did the implicit bias training, we did that throughout the department and we did it in person um, throughout the bureaus and we worked with the training support specialists to get all of that scheduled, but that was pre-COVID. Um, uh, that still is an option for us, depending upon what it looks like uh, for the training when it gets back up and running. Um, but clearly we need to um, get another training out there. In 2017, we actually put out a portal message and it brought the awareness up to the members um, to the point where the boxes that could be checked in our EPCRs or electronic patient records, um, there was an uptick in terms of the metrics of that and then it fell off, very similar to what we see post-disaster you know, the further we get from that disaster, the more complacent we become. Um, and speaking with some of our members that work in the field, you know, there are some questions that I think that we can do better at answering and, and doing some research on. And that, that specifically means um, oftentimes the victim does not want to press charges. They do not want, um, you know, any, anything to happen, uh, even though they are in that type of a situation. So, it's it's a it's an education piece as well as uh, a learning a learning piece for all of us in um, again what's our best approach to this type of training and to date we are only showing nine cases that have been documented via the EPCR because that's really the only way that we can get those metrics but I get a weekly EMS report and that's what it shows that was as of December so. Um, I spoke with Chief Carrazas about this, Chief Crowley, of course, as well. Um, but I, I, I feel, again, confident that um, we can bring this to the forefront. It's just a matter of the best platform to do that. And uh, 
I believe that working with our LAPD partners, because we often respond with them on these on these types of calls, or they call us uh, when they get the call, they're they're doing 45,000 calls a year, and we're showing nine. So there there's a huge gap there. Um, and we just have to work towards the education piece. Um, and then maybe I think a, a collaborative effort on how do we educate our members and how do we give them more information to feel confident about putting a check mark in that box. And, that, and, and then where does it go from there, right? So there's still, there are some questions from the field personnel. Um, and I, I just look at it as the education piece. Very, uh, very good. Thank you very much for that report. Um, are there com comments or questions from the commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Ninberg. Hi, uh, Chief Gerlich. Yes. Um, thank you, Madam President. Uh, nine for the year? Uh, for 2021? 20, yes. Wow. What was it the year before? Um, the year before was even less than that, but in 17, I think we had 16. It's still not a lot, not a lot at all. I mean, and it's, it's a level, it's, it's an issue of priority, um, this kind of training. I mean, I understand COVID and whatnot, but, um, you know, each one, mm -hmm each identified case could save a life. Absolutely. These are highly volatile. Mm -hmm. some of these, in, in PD, there are some of the most, most dangerous calls to go on because they're erratic. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, they're violent. And um, I think that it is imperative that we elevate this to, I mean, these are crises numbers. They, you know, 45,000 identified cases in LAPD a year of domestic violence. That's a crisis. We need to treat it as such. And I understand um, 2020 being a problem that was, but, um, and or beginning of 2021, I think that we could, we can do better on this. I think human trafficking training um, was also, oh, I thought it was when I sat in on the training and we had it, um, outside, um, providers as well as LAPD, LAPD did a great job. And I, I'm with you on that. I think they do a fantastic job. I think we had rainbow services do the domestic violence. They did human trafficking and, um, this is what they do. So, um, Seeing the transformation in, like, I didn't know what to look for when with young women and, and changing their, the view from, you know, some, from, you know, criminal to victim is, is, and changing that perception that, you know, these are victims, human trafficking, young women, the average age is 12 that they enter into this. Um, and most are taken. Um, and they're enslaved. So I think that um, because LAFD has such an unusual ability to have access to these victims, because there's no threat of being arrested, you know, there's no threat of, you know, they're there to help, there's more trust with the LAFD, we, I remember that in, during the training that the LAPD said they would kill to have that level of trust and that ability to see these victims and get them the help they need. And we really need to take advantage of that. Um, so I do implore, um, certainly during COVID, I can understand um, doing virtual trainings. Um, I do think face-to-face -face trainings matter um when we get out of this um and 
I, um, I appreciate once again, that, uh, that these reports are honest and, you know, I look forward to seeing, like having these numbers, having this database and using this to compare, you know, our successes or our failures, you know, like when we saw a drop. Um, so I just want to say, um, when do you think that the training is going to begin? Yo, you're on mute. I would be speculating um, because it's not coming out of, uh, well, I'll, I'll rephrase that. It's a collaborative effort. I would, you know, between in-service training and administrative operations, emergency operations. So, I mean, it's a conversation that needs to be had. And as we move forward, um, I can't give you a definitive answer right now. Okay. Um, and there may be Chief Crowley may weigh in or, or another member who might have better insight on that, but I'm not going to give you something that I don't know right. to be true, right? That's not fair. Right, and I know that this is a transition period. I do think that it's, um, if we got a portal message in 2017 and now it's five years later, but it's probably time to get another portal message in. Um, and, and we do have a department bulletin as well that, you know, so, I mean, we do have documentation. Um, it isn't like we haven't done anything, but uh, right. uh, in truth, we, we definitely, we need to step up and then we can, we can pick this up and we can push it forward. Um, there, there was a um, bulletin that came out Thursday, February 7th of 2019, and that was on human trafficking and domestic violence. And that was quite a, quite a long um well, it was a one page and it was great. And then it also referred to the department bulletin uh, 1904, which is identification and treatment of known and sus or suspected victims of domestic violence. So we do have documentation. I do agree. Um, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I, I, I think that we have, we have good documents there. We can revisit that as well as figure out what this package is going to look like and to your point, uh, um, the in-person training is valuable, uh, and it's about having those conversations, right? It's not just about recognizing it. It's about how do we teach our members to have those conversations when that victim doesn't want to have that conversation. So it is a trust issue. We are good at it. We know, but we do have to teach our members how to have that conversation and the importance behind it. I think uh, Chief has his hand up. Chief? Yeah. Tarazi. During this um, conversation, uh, I think we, we have been, of course, impacted by, by COVID, but I think we can post something in an info notice as a reminder. So, Chief Ehrlich, go ahead and uh, craft a message as a reminder, and we'll post that as soon as you're ready to post. Yes, sir. Great. Great. That's, a, that's appreciated. I think just making sure that it's at the top of mind for people. I, I will say that... Um, I did speak to a chief during that training and he came up to me and said, you know, when I walked into this training, I didn't want to go. I thought it was going to be a waste of time. And, you know, it's not, it's, um, you know, operational it's, and he said he came out transformed and seeing these young women and young men as victims. And, you know, he's like, I used to look at these young women, you know, whatever, like the way the culture sees prostitution. And he's like, I had no idea. And he's like, it completely changed my outlook. And he was really grateful for the training. And, um, and I know that the department, you know, people don't want to do this kind of training, but, um, but it is really important. And you will, you can have the opportunity to save a life that no other person would have access to doing so. So. Um, I look forward to the bulletin and I look forward to seeing um, a schedule of training as well and what we have planned. So thank you so much for this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Chief Gerlick, for the uh, research and information that and everything that you've been putting together. Um, and you have continued to work on this even during the COVID time. So thank you very much for that work. Um, are there any other comments from commissioners? 
If not, can we have uh, a motion is in order for to receive and file item 22-006. Thank you, Dr. Hara. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Gomez, would you roll call, please? I apologize. I've been using my space bar this time to temporarily unmute, and it had been working until now. What's Gray? Aye. Hara? Aye. And Ninberg? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, now we move on to um, the next thing, uh, the next item C. Good morning, Madam President. Good morning, Chief. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, I'm here to present you with uh, item 6C, just an update on our, our, our COVID uh, vaccination compliance and the um, non-compliance process as it goes forward. So good morning, Madam President, Commissioners. Um, my name is Graham Everett. I'm a Deputy Chief and I serve as the Chief of Staff. So this is a verbal report and it'll provide you with some numbers and it kind of uh, just keep in mind that these numbers do change daily. Um, we get a lot of people coming in and out of different areas of these uh, numbers. So we track it pretty much every day, all day is uh, planning is uh, tracking these numbers. So our department employees, we have 3,727 department employees. Of that number, 3,175 are fully vaccinated. That's a that's about just a tick over 85 percent. Um, we also have 470 uh, folks that have that have requested an exemption, either religious or medical. Um, of that 470 number, 93 are fully vaccinated, um, but they are still able to request an exemption. And that's mm -hmm. what they're doing. And we're going through that exemption process right now with the personnel department. Uh, 377 of those members are not fully vaccinated. Um, of those members, uh, 49 have requested a medical exemption and 318 have requested a religious exemption. 10 people have requested both. Um, mm. So as, and then another interesting number that uh, I think is very telling, um, of our 3,175 fully vaccinated members, uh, we have, and, and if you add that number with the number of people that have requested an exemption as the ordinance allows, that gives us, uh, which is 377, that gives us 3,552 members who are fully compliant with the ordinance uh, as it's written. So. Um, that's 90, that's just over 95% of our department in compliance with the requirements of the ordinance as, as we see the numbers right now. Um, we did send uh, notices to comply to 333 members. 93 of those members became compliant before we were required to send them home. Um, 240 members uh, were placed off duty. Now of that 240, 208 have become compliant and they've returned to duty. Um, and when I say compliant, it's either that they have become fully vaccinated or they've requested an exemption, either medical or religious, and it's pending a review. So we have 30, that leaves us with 32 members um, that are uh, on administrative leave and they're pending the non-compliance process on the corrective action, um, which we are processing right now. Um, we're going through the uh, process of serving them notice, and we will follow through as the charter prescribes, following all the procedures within the Charter 1060, the Firefighter Bill of Rights, and the MOU provisions that require us in the disciplinary process. Um, so that'll be moving forward in the coming weeks. Um, another interesting number that we kind of see fluctuate almost hourly is the number of members that are currently off duty with uh, COVID. They're in isolation or some level of, uh, of an infection. Today, this morning, we have uh, 135 members isolating at home. 
and uh, with various levels of, of illness. Uh, 17 are unable to return to duty um, on a long-term basis. They've been off for a long period of time. Um, and we have one member on light duty, uh, one member admitted for long-term recovery, and obviously, unfortunately, two of our members have passed away from this virus. So uh, that 135 number does change, like I said, hourly, uh, and we do keep our eye on that because it impacts directly our staffing numbers day to day. So that's the, the rundown currently. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, thank you, Chief. Uh, sounds like uh, things are improving in some way, in many ways. Um, so that's good. Uh, are there comments, questions, Commissioner Nimber, Commissioner Hara? No. Commissioner Nimber? Commissioner Hara. Yes. Oh, did, Dr. did Commissioner Hara have something to say? He said, he said no. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for this report. I, um, I, so what percent of, you have 85% of the department, but what percent of sworn are um, fully vaccinated compared to not fully vaccinated? Uh, I have that number. It's, it's just over 80, but I have to look it up. I don't have the, I have it buried somewhere in one of my emails, but we get that on a daily basis as well. And we keep track of the sworn numbers and the civilian numbers, but we also keep them department wide. Okay. So it's about 80, you're, you're looking at about 20% yeah. of the department of those serving the public are not vaccinated, correct? No. Um, That's a lot more. It's, it's, so the way you got to look at it is there's some, mem there's, there's 80, 85% that number that are fully vaccinated, sworn employees that are fully vaccinated. There are members that have requested an exemption. Right. And, and that number varies, you know, depending if you're looking at civilian and sworn, but that's a large number as well. So they're in compliance to the ordinance. Sure. They, you know, are conducting their tests and doing their thing. Um, sure. So that number, when you combine those two, is about 95% of our department is um is in compliance to the ordinance now the main thing though if they're in the field treating the public um members are either fully vaccinated or they're in compliance to the ordinance pending an exemption and they are testing twice a week and and you know wearing ppe just like everyone else but our sworn numbers right around 77 percent somewhere in there so 77 percent of our sworn members are vaccinated correct Okay, so 23% are not vaccinated. Right. Well, yeah, there's some level because some people are partially vaccinated. Um, you know, we have like 31 people in that group. So there's a small percentage that are, if not one or the other, there's a bunch of different categories. There's fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, not vaccinated, declined to state, no report, you know, so sure. there's a lot of things that we look at, but generally speaking, yeah, you could say, yeah, about 20, 23% or not. Okay. And I mean, I, the problem is, is that, yes, I understand, I understand that. I understand what the, what the mandate is and the ordinance. Absolutely. You know, if you're, you know, applying for an exemption, um, you can take a test. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, cause I saw in, Orange County, they had a lot of people um, off with COVID, and the majority of them were unvaccinated. So can I get those numbers? Now, I know it fluctuates daily, but like whenever the report comes, we need to get a report so we can track it. Can we, can we show what that looks like, those that are out with COVID and that are showing symptoms? Because many people, you know, People, you can have symptoms even if you're fully vaccinated. We know that. Um, but the likelihood of, you know, having severe illness and whatnot, I mean, it plummets uh, when you're fully vaccinated. And your immunity is heightened when you're fully vaccinated with, boost, with a booster, with Omicron. So um, I'd love to get those numbers. Those, and it can be a snapshot. And then when you give the report, um, we can 
go over that, you know, the changes in those numbers. But I think that it's important for the public to know who's coming to their aid if you're going, if you live in a nursing home. And I understand, you know, we are doing the best we can with having tests, but also it impacts our population if I don't know if it's the same here in LA, if more people are out with COVID who are unvaccinated. I don't know. It'd be really good to see that information. Um, I think that's important for the public to have that. Um, Ma'am, I, I don't know what Orange County is doing. We're following the city's ordinance. So I'm not, no, can, I'm talking about the, the report. I saw a report that their numbers, uh, people out with COVID, are significantly higher for the unvaccinated than the vaccinated. So that's what I'm saying. And it'd be really great to see so us do that. That's what I'm asking. Do you want a report of the people that are in isolation that are positively vaccinated? Because I don't know if it's the same. I don't know if it was a snapshot, whatever. Their right. vaccination rates are much lower than ours. So, that, um, so, so they don't have any. That's what I want to clarify. So yeah. we have today, this morning, we have 135 people off in isolation, yeah. right? Yeah. You want to know how many of those 135 are vaccinated and how many are not? Fully vaccinated. Right, right. Fully vaccinated and how many are not, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, I can get that for you. Um, like I say, that number changes not just daily. Hourly. 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 Um, I, get, I, I get two or three of reports of those a day, so I don't know which snapshot you want me to take um do you want like that many or do you want one day or a week or you know you know what i mean like, yeah, like a maybe, snapshot in time. you know for the next commission meeting maybe just yeah just i would like to see you know look we're at a surge it's probably going to plummet um hopefully i don't know but if we're like new york it will i see a crest oh. i just saw the graph i saw it going down a little bit right so, and, we're no, and we're no different. I mean, we're, we're going to have some people that are fully vaccinated that are testing positive or that are, that are in isolation. Right. So what I'll do is for the next meeting, in addition to the isolation numbers, we'll break that down to fully vaccinated in isolation and not vaccinated in isolation. Perfect. That, does that work? Yeah. And okay. like for this week, maybe like, you know, whenever you, when is the report due for the next commission meeting? I don't know. Um, tomorrow, the next commission yesterday. meeting, it would be, it would be due to me on the seventh. It would be yesterday. To how about, okay. How about verbal but, report then? Yeah, verbal. I'll just do it verbal and I'll, I'll have the number from the day before or whatever. And, and also, um, okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, also, cause I don't know, I, I have no idea. It'd be really interesting to get that data. Um, also of the, um, exemptions. Do we have a timeline for when they're going to be processed through personnel? Have they given you a timeline? Oh, the exemption request? Mm -hmm. That's um, ongoing. You know, it's going to take, um, we anticipate it's going to take some, uh, probably at least a month, not, not days, um, because the process that exists at each department is doing an um, internal intake, and then they provide that information to the personnel department and the personnel department reviews as well. So once the decision is made at the personnel department, anyone that wants to appeal that, it'll go back to the general manager. However, that process is citywide. And I really, we don't really know their priority order on what department or if they have an order like that or if it's coming, taken as they come in. Um, so that that's kind of up in the air. I know there's uh, quite a few uh, exemptions that they're looking at for all city departments that personnel department is reviewing. So we anticipate it's going to be months rather than, you know, in the near, near, near future. Okay. So um, have you had any that have been processed through personnel yet? Uh, I think we've sent uh, a couple of batches over to personnel, but you I don't know that we've them. seen. Yeah. I don't think we've received anything back from them yet. I know we are currently internally we are currently conducting interviews with those members, and we have about, I think we have uh, a number of groups that are performing those interviews to expedite as much as we can. Okay, and then in your interviews, then they, then it goes to a Board of Rights, or how does that? How does no, that... no, so you're talking about two different things. 
Right. People, people that have asked for exemptions, they go through a process where their exemption request is reviewed and they get an interview and they go through this process. And then also it goes to the personnel department for a decision. The board of rights process is for members that are not in compliance to the ordinance. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so that's like the 37 members or something. 32, yes. 32. You're like, no, it's 32. <laughs> it is. It's and that okay. number and that number changes quite a bit as well because when we first started, we had 104. It was a lot. And and people came, you know, that number kept dwindling down. So yeah, we're moving through that process, and that process is described in the in the charter, um, yeah. and also our you know, we're compliant with the Bill of Rights and the MOU provisions that are required, so. Okay, so the exemptions are not open to uh, border rights? No. Okay, that's a, that's so that's not the process. That's what I'm saying that process doesn't include border rights. Correct. And I know that's, that that is liberal. So the exemption process actually is a reasonable accommodation process at the end. So if a member, let's say, gets approved for an exemption, then obviously they would work through those um, whatever reasonable accommodation was made to allow them to have that approval. Uh, you know, that could be whatever they determine is reasonable. However, if a member is denied an exemption and they can appeal it, and if it's further denied, the member will have time to come into compliance with the ordinance. Um, if they're not compliant at the end of all that, then you might see that other process to say, hey, you know, this is part of the disciplinary side now. Okay. At okay, so end, we could potentially we could potentially see hundreds of cases if they push. It. I don't yeah. know. I mean, I mean, theoretically, if I had an exemption on file and I exhausted all efforts uh, for my appeal, for my all of my efforts within the reasonable accommodation process to uh, get my exemption approved, and at the end of the whole process, it was not approved. Um, I would still have time to come into compliance with the with the ordinance. If I chose not to, then yeah, the, the, the department's remedy at this time under the ordinance is to separate that member from the department. Um, and like okay. I said, right. And then yeah. if you're not in compliance, it's leave with no pay, correct? If you're not in compliance, you're leaving. It is. No pay. It is. You're you're on administrative leave, no pay, correct? Correct. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, that that actually will make a difference. Okay. I just was trying to understand the whole process of and and getting keeping in mind like how long it's going to take. Yeah, to... it's you know our department we've got uh, where are my numbers we had four hundred and um, uh, we have four hundred and seventy uh, exemptions exemptions and uh, requests for an exemption. Um, other departments I'm sure have you know their numbers are, are high as well. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, discussion about that. And uh, personnel department is is working hard to get through all of those. Um, and and if, if that part's gonna take some time and we understand that part. That's why members that are uh, have a, a, an exemption on file, there is an avenue for them to continue to work as long as they continue to test and they're wearing their PPEs. Um, that's compliant with the ordinance. So the ordinance does speak to that. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. No, I know. I, um, but I appreciate this and I appreciate you giving us the numbers and, um, and then breaking them out as well for the next report. So yeah, um, we'll do that on the next one. Okay. Thank you. So uh, chief does fully vaccinated mean uh, a booster or that's just the so, two vaccines. So good question. So, they do discuss the booster within the ordinance. Um, uh, under the the way the ordinance is written right now, um, you know, speaking with the city attorney, at this point, it, it seems like council may have to take an action to to require the booster as part of the definition of fully vaccinated, based on the way the ordinance is written. But that's really a legal opinion, and not for me to say. Um, but kind of based on our reading, because we're looking at that to see, okay, well is the booster a uh, part of the definition of fully vaccinated or is it the two shot series or the one shot series with the given time at the end, which is the current definition. So we continue to look at that. Um, and, and, and again, it'll be a city um, uh, decision because it's, it's, it's the ordinance that we're all following 
and that'll come from the city attorney's office and city council, you know, as they go through. Okay, very good. Are there any other questions or concerns from commissioners? If, uh, if yes. not. One, and, and to piggyback on what you're saying, uh, Commissioner, uh, Madam President. So do you have, you have access to the percent of boosted and non-boosted? Do you have that information? I think I have access to, I have to check with medical liaison to see if we do. I think we do. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure if that's just members that were boosted within the department or if they went to an outside entity or so I have to double check on that. I don't know if I have the complete picture of boosted members. Okay. If you have that, that would be great to put it in. Um, and, yeah. and just to be clear, as, I know. You know, as we stand today. I know what's legal and what's what well, is no. the ordinance and what's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I just mean they the booster is not in, in from what I understand mandated. Is it's not part of the definition of fully vaccinated um within the ordinance so i know many of our members are boosted but right. uh, i'll try to get that number for you i'm guessing the majority would be but um yeah so okay that i mean that, that it's just interesting information to have and i know that it is not part of the ordinance per se the language is not clear so um certainly we're dealing in a pandemic it changes all the time so um thank you that's all okay thank you very much chief uh, for keeping us informed on that in that COVID-19 issue. Um, that is the last item on our agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Oh, it's been moved and second that we adjourn our meeting. Um, Ms. Gomez, would you do a roll call, please? That's great. Yes. Tara. Aye. Ninberg. Yes. We're adjourned. Thank you.